Welcome to the Mind Coordinator, where we delve deep in understanding and optimizing mental health, resilience, and performance. I'm your host, Dr. David Schoonover, and I'm excited to embark on this journey with you to explore the intricate connections between our minds, emotions, and personal growth. Whether you're an athlete, a coach, a sports enthusiast, or someone interested in mental well-being, this is the place where we navigate the complexities of the mind to unlock our full potential. Join me as we uncover strategies, insights, and conversations that inspire positive change and foster mental resilience in all aspects of life. You're listening to The Mind Coordinator with Dr. David Schoonover on KSHP AM 1400, 107.1 FM, and VSX Digital Sports Network. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to Session 4 of The Mind Coordinator. Today, we embark on a journey through the interconnected realm of sports psychology, therapeutic interventions like the Lighthouse Sessions, and their profound impact on both coaches and players in the dynamic world of sports. Sports psychology isn't just about winning games. It's about understanding the intricate mental frameworks that drive peak performance, resilience, and well-being in athletes. From motivation to confidence to focus and emotional control, the mental game often determines who emerges victorious on the field or the court. But it's just not about individual athletes. It's also about the team dynamic, coaching strategies, and the universal approach to mental health and performance optimization. This is where the Lighthouse Sessions Therapy and similar interventions come into play, offering tailored support to athletes and coaches alike. Imagine a scenario where a team is struggling with performance anxiety or communication breakdowns. Traditional coaching methods can only go so far without addressing the underlying mental blocks or team dynamics. This is where the integrating sports psychology principles and therapeutic techniques can create profound shifts in mindset, teamwork, and overall performance outcomes. Coaches, as the architects of athletic development and team culture, play a pivotal role in fostering a positive mental environment. Their understanding of sports psychology principles equips them to motivate players, build resilience in the face of adversity, and cultivate a winning mindset that transcends the scoreboard. Moreover, athletes and coaches today face a myriad of challenges beyond physical demands of their sport, from managing stress and pressure to navigating personal setbacks and transitions. Mental health awareness and, sport and support excuse me, are an integral to nurturing well-rounded, successful athletes. In our session today, we plan to undercover practical strategies success stories, and collaborative approaches that blend sports psychology insights with therapeutic support systems like the Lighthouse Sessions. By understanding how mental health influences athletic performance and coaching strategies, we can unlock new potential, build stronger teams, and champion holistic well-being in sports. So let's dive deep into this fascinating intersection where the mind meets muscle, and together, light the pathway to excellence both on and off the field. Thank you for joining us on this enlightened journey. You're listening to The Mind Coordinator with Dr. David Schoonover on KSHP AM 1400, 107.1 FM, and VSX Digital Sports Network. According to a VA study, each day 22 veterans take their own lives. Together we can win the war against veteran suicide. Join Mission 22 to let our veterans know that they have an army behind them that cares. This salute is courtesy of Pops Automotive, where they're serving our area with integrity and excellence. For all of your automotive needs, stop by 1433 South Main Street in Las Vegas or call them at 702-676-1002. That's 702-676-1002. That's Pops Automotive on the air saluting our troops and veterans. I'm Lieutenant Colonel David Flippo, and I approve this message. Open borders, crime, inflation, failing schools. Is this the nation Democrats think we truly deserve? Republican Colonel David Flippo stands ready to represent District 4 and all Nevadans with unwavering commitment and strength. He's not just promising change, he's ready to deliver it. With a focus on economic freedom, Colonel Flippo pledges to cut bureaucratic red tape 
and create an environment where Nevada small business can survive and thrive, giving power to entrepreneurs and employees like you to drive our economy forward. As a combat veteran, Colonel Flippo knows the importance of national security. He's seen the border crisis firsthand and is dedicated to securing our nation and communities. On education, Colonel Flippo is committed to ensuring that parents have the right to raise their children with integrity and without interference. With Colonel Flippo, it's about taking real action that will shape a brighter Nevada future for us all. Early voting starts soon, and the primary is June 11, 2024. Blue No More to get ahead in District 4. Let's flip it red with Colonel Flippo. Paid for by the committee to elect Lieutenant Colonel David Flippo. I'm Dr. David Schoonover, your dedicated formation therapist. Feeling weighed down by life's challenges? Let's navigate them together. Whether it's sports psychology, relationships, or career struggles, I'm here to guide you towards clarity and healing. Take the first step towards a brighter tomorrow. Visit thelighthousesessions.com or call 702-518-4393. Schedule your consultation. I'm Dr. Schooner. Together, let's illuminate your path and your inner light. I'm Dr. David Schooner, your dedicated formation therapist. Feeling weighed down by life's challenges? Let's navigate them together. Whether it's sports psychology, relationships, or career struggles, I'm here to guide you towards clarity and healing. Take the first step towards a brighter tomorrow. Visit thelighthousesessions.com or call 702-518-4393. Schedule your consultation. I'm Dr. Schooner. Together, let's illuminate your path and your inner light. You're listening to The Mind Coordinator with Dr. David Schoonover. On KSHP, AM 1400, 107.1 FM, and BSX Digital Sports Network. All right, guys, we are back. We have got a fantastic show for you today. Before we get into the introduction of our our guest, I just want to pose this question and, and listen carefully. Imagine a scenario where two athletes with similar physical abilities compete in a high stakes game. One excels under pressure, maintains focus, and performs at their peak while the other struggles with anxiety, doubts, and inconsistency. What sets them apart? It is not their physical prowess, but it's their mental game, which is at the heart of sports psychology. And I want to give you just a couple of examples here. Uh, I want you to think about uh, a guy named Michael Jordan, widely regarded as one of the greatest basketball players of all time. Michael Jordan credited his mental toughness and focus as key factors in his success. He famously used visualization techniques to imagine a game-winning scenario, and he mentally prepared for these high-pressure situations. Serena Williams, everybody knows her, a dominant force in women's tennis. She spoke about the importance of mental resilience and staying focused during matches. She works with sports psychologists to manage stress, maintain confidence, and stay mentally sharp throughout her career. Tom Brady, Tom Brady, widely known as probably one of the best quarterbacks that's ever played the game, But he's known for his exceptional mental preparation and his ability to perform under pressure. He emphasizes the importance of mental toughness, visualization, and positive self-talk in his approach to the game, contributing to his multiple Super Bowl victories. Chicago Bulls. During their dominant run in the 1990s, the Chicago Bulls, led by Michael Jordan and Coach Phil Jackson, they integrated sports psychology principles into their team culture. They emphasized mental toughness, team cohesion, and mindfulness to excel under pressure. And lastly, Michael Phelps. Olympic swimmer Michael Phelps is the most decorated Olympian of all time, but he worked extensively with sports psychologists to improve that mental approach to swimming. Techniques, again, like visualization, goal setting, and managing pre-race anxiety were crucial to his record-breaking performances. These are just examples of, of, of how we highlight these elite athletes and their successful teams, and how they leverage mental training and sports psychology techniques to enhance their performance, and how to manage stress, how to maintain peak levels of motivation and confidence during competition. Their experiences underscore the integral role of mental skills achieving excellence in sports. All right, we're going to keep that in mind. Today, I want to talk about our our, our guest, an amazing man. Uh, his resume is just incredible. He was an NFL professional football player for the Minnesota Vikings. 
He was a high school All-American football and basketball and track, number one recruited tight end in the country. Uh, first team All-American, All-Western Athletic Conference, two years, college All-American his senior year, member of the UNLV Football Hall of Fame. He was drafted in 99 in the sixth round by the Vikings and played five years and was a full-time starter for three years. His community work is impressive, too. Uh, pardon me, he's a, a member of Omega Psi Psi Community and Service and Omega Gents Mentoring Program. He's a member of the National Football League community Tuesdays and assisting with NFL youth football camps. camps. He's involved with the NFL speaking engagements to speak to the less fortunate kids for five years. Presently a member of the National Football League Players Association. This man is incredible. Ladies and gentlemen, let's hear it for Chalance Sawyer. Yes, sir. Uh, I appreciate that introduction, Doc. Certainly, Clance. I we I have a million questions I want to ask you today, but I just want to kind of get started and kind of go back to what my my original question was was when you've got these two scenarios. You've got this one athlete. He's 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 an incredible athlete. Both of them are definitely uh, similar in their their capabilities, right? But one guy really excels under pressure, right? He's he's focused. He's performing at high peak, or him or her. Um, but the other one doesn't, and he has doubts and anxiety. What sets them apart? How do you deal with either one of those? Well, the one that's um, that can deal with the pressure, um, most of the time he's been kind of mentally trained at some point on how to understand the pressure, how to understand what's going on, that it's go- that it's going to be pressure, it's going to be loud noises from the outside, whether we're talking the real crowd or media, people talking, people, um, you know, having negative things to say um, in the newspaper, whatever the case may be. So somewhere along the line, he, he has had a mentor or a coach that has explained that type of pressure to him and how to deal with it, how to process it. And, and, and it comes with mental training. Uh, the one that that can't deal with it, he hasn't had that. So all those things I just mentioned um, rattles him. Uh, he can't perform up under that, even though he has the same mm-hmm. level of athletic ability and capability as the guy that, that's able to deal with it. Um, but because everything starts with the mind, you know, nothing else can, can get going if the mental capacity is not right. So... That's why it's so important to make sure the mental state is where it needs to be in order to have great performances um, day in and day out, night in and night out, and, and to be consistent. That's how you become, you know, labeled as as this great player. You got to be able to do it on a consistent basis. Sure, sure. You know, I, I totally agree with that, Lance. The other thing that's is interesting here is you take the guy that's not doing so well. There is a huge stigma, and let me just pause for a second there. Mental awareness, you see stickers and, and TV commercials and billboards. Uh, you see these advertisements uh, during sporting events. Such a huge push, but it's a very few, it's a very small percentage of people that actually get help. And typically, it's the coach or assistant coaches that can spot this in, in their athletes. What do you think or what have you done in your in your lifetime or have you experienced with other players that... They know they need help. They're afraid of the stigma of going to get help. And how do you go about leading them the right way? Right. Yeah. I think uh, up until recent times, we we all been um, dealing with that stigma as far as um, you know athletes of recent time because we're just not being educated about mental health, how important it is. Um, we just never knew really what it was. We just always accepted whatever came with, you know, with the game, you know, with this, this whole macho mindset, you know, that that's how we was programmed. That's how we was trained, sure. you know, just accept whatever happened and suck it up, get it together. If not, you know, you, you are the weaker of the, of the bunch. If, if you can't do that, we never knew that we was actually, dealing with something mental that was preventing us from being able to uh, showcase and perform in front of these, these youth coaches that we had. And they didn't even understand it because they was only doing what they've been taught. So it's been a, 
a generational thing where the information wasn't present for us to uh, get the right help we needed. So when it came about, it was easy for us just to, you know, ignore it or turn our back on it or not want to be embarrassed by a peer saying that, you know, I need help or I need to go talk to someone or, um, so that made it easy not to accept it because of how we was already programmed. Sure. We just didn't want to be, be saw as the weaker person. Yep. So now I think that we've been more educated on it and understanding that a lot of us have had things going on where we needed to talk to someone. Um, and things have happened um, to loved ones or friends, whether it was suicide or they went out and did something to someone else um, that really woke us all up and made us realize that, man, we got to really get this word out, get this information out to make sure people get the help they need so we can prevent some of these things moving forward. So that, that's kind of been my outlook and understanding of what's going on. Yeah, I totally agree. Everything's different uh, from what it was 10, 20, 30 years ago. Very different in sports. And you're right. The suck it up mentality was, that was uh, protocol. That was it. Right? Yes, sir. You're having a bad day. Suck it up. Tomorrow will be better. But, you know, there's so many factors that go into this. You've got the factors from home and how they were raised, culture, uh, the climate of the home, how it was, were they nurtured in, in college, were they told they were the best, and all of a sudden they, they don't make it pro, and these guys have a meltdown. It's good to see people that are famous speaking out on this. Now, that helps. It kind of opens the door. But they still have to walk through that door. Simone Biles, uh, just like one of the greatest female gymnasts of our time, she actually, in 2020, in the Tokyo Olympics, she withdrew from a couple of those events because her mind wasn't right. Just, just a, a, another way of saying it, right? And it really, it, it sparked a lot of important conversations about mental health. People were looking at Simone Biles like she was going to walk out of there with a truckload of gold medals. But she was not right. Something was wrong mentally, and she knew it, and she took a break. She's very open about seeking professional support, you know, taking mental health breaks, those kind of things. I think that if, right. we, if we would, you know, take a look at just from a coaching standpoint, how they how they should, <clears throat> I feel they should integrate that into their their daily interactions with their their athletes, right? So the athletes get up in the morning. It's 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 just the, the what I call the hamster wheel. It's the same thing over and over. Wake up, uh, go to your classes, get your tutoring, get out of class. Uh, you're going to go to whatever sport it is. You're going to run your practices, learn your plays. Uh, the weekends come, same thing, and then you prepare for uh, for the game at hand. But I don't hear, and it's very, very rare. I've been doing this a long time, Slens. I It's rare that I hear, okay, guys, you're going to spend an hour with, uh, you know, Dr. Jones or whoever it may be just to talk to him to see what's going on. What, how, what, how is that? Have you noticed any of that in your experiences with in the pro level? No, nah, they, 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 they had nothing in place uh, during the time that I was in the league that, um, that focused on your mental health. Um, at the same time, again, we have to understand that I was under the, under the, um, under the guys who, who was considered to be old school coaches. So their old school mentality was blue collar. Again, suck it up, get it done. You can't get it done. Next man up. Um, in recent time, um, with our NFL PA, NFL Players Association, and NFL alumni, they offer a lot more. And, you know, we got hotlines, places we can call, uh, different programs that we can reach out to and get all these benefits for free. So I think it come a long way. It's, it's night and day from, you know, where it was just for me um, going back to, you know, little league or even high school, nothing was in place. So now I see that, you know, they're talking about it a little bit more on a high school level, even, even a, a pop Warner level, definitely uh, the collegiate level. And because I'm involved in NFL PA, NFL alumni, I, I definitely see it. And I, I know the benefits that we get on that particular level, but mm -hmm. it's real important, man. It's, it's, it's super important. We can't put enough emphasis on it. Um, and I, I would piggyback 
to say this too. Um, we do have a, a culture of us, um, I guess, quote unquote, African Americans that come from environments where we have seen different things and um, um, an environment that we may not have been in control of, but those things, you know, may have affected affected a lot of us moving on into our adult life, and we never we ne- we never got help for that type of trauma. So, you know, I just think we have to look at the whole spectrum, the whole, the whole person versus just looking at it based on athletics or sport. We got to really dig into the background and see what one may have been through, uh, even outside the sports realm. Absolutely. I, I've worked with, uh, with kids, high school kids, uh, in the past uh, to Lance that were gifted athletes, but, to hear gunshots at night, that was normal for them. And, and where they grew up, not a good area. Uh, they might see, you know, fights going on all the time. They may see drugs. And it's it's tough because that gets ingrained into their minds that that's a way of life. So if, if something doesn't go right, uh, you wait for the guy afterwards and you, you start a fight with the guy. And it's so important that there's so much wasted by not, you know, getting into their life, understanding what's going on, teaching them mental toughness, letting them know that none of that was their fault. It was just a, a byproduct of their environment, and their future is so bright. And it's it's a really tough thing sometimes to uh, to uh, talk to right. young kids about. It. it really is. Exactly. Then I, I would also pick it back and say that um, concussions. What well, people don't understand, concussions also happen you know, on the pop one level, you know, way before the brain is developed. Now, now that we know that the science is out there letting us know that the brain don't develop until we're 25 years old. So all these things are happening because kids are hitting a, and getting concussions, even at the pop one level, the junior high level, high school. So when I came through, none of these things was ever diagnosed. We never, you get knocked out of the game, you go out, get a little smell and salt, Ask you how you feel. I'm okay. All right, get back in there. Uh-huh. So I think that a lot of things happen mentally, mind being shifted um, from from the, those concussion traumas that happened that never got the attention, never got checked out thoroughly. Like, because now that I know, you don't even supposed to go to sleep until you get checked out because you can have, ble- I mean, bleeding on the brain or sure, sure. things of that nature. So, so I just think it's a lot of guys or females in whatever sport they play that might have hit their head, whatever the case may be, and went on to grow up with those brain injuries that, that, that never got um, checked out, never got looked into, that also could have caused a shift in their, um, in their mental health. Absolutely. Absolutely. I've wondered that about some of my friends growing up. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> I've always asked them right. if they fell down or got bonked on the head or something <laughs> because they act how they act. Um, no, <laughs> exactly. you're, you're absolutely right. And, uh, you know, it's just it's just be making it more aware. It's making it more accessible. Like you said, right now, it's in today's world, there are all sorts of avenues for guys to get help. It doesn't cost them a penny, whether at the university uh, whether they're pro athletes, they're ready to help people. But it's that stigma, right? Chalance is getting help. There's something wrong with him. No, there's not. What's wrong is your attitude towards Chalance. He knows he needs help. He's getting it. And in the short, what I think the average football player, pro uh, pro player plays about four years, I think is about the average. Uh, right. Right. They make their money and they're done. Now what? Well, that problem still exists. So if he's getting help during those playing days, uh, it just helps them be a better person all the way around, a better husband, a better father, a uh, better mentor, you know, those kind of things. Right. I agree. I agree a thousand percent. One of the, uh, one of the examples I like to use, and it's, it's, uh, it's just a tough thing to talk about, is a, a young man named Vince Young. When Vince Young was in Texas, he had been coddled most of his life. He was an incredible athlete. Amazing quarterback, national champion, right? And Vince goes into the pros, and a couple of years in, he's having an okay season. He's starting out. He's doing pretty good. But then he gets booed. 
the crowd starts booing him for not making a couple passes. And Vince had this issue when he was in high school. But no one addressed it because he was the gifted athlete. Nobody addressed it at Texas because he was the gifted athlete. And now he's in pro, and that, that problem still exists. So now Vince just, his whole world sh- shuts down. He starts having football mm-hmm. games, it's over, and then after football, he gets into a lot of trouble. I see that happen. I, I've had an opportunity to work with a lot of pro athletes in football and basketball and soccer. And it's it seems it's the same, and I hear it all the time. If they would have had, it's kind of high sight. hindsight's twenty twenty, right? If they would have had the opportunity, if they would have reached out, if they would have got the help, their lives would have definitely been different. Right, right, most definitely. Yep, I agree. I mean, you even you even have other cases where <clears throat> I try to explain to people, uh, you know, when, when you're playing a game like football, which you got to have a, an aggressive nature, but this, this aggr- aggressive nature been programmed in you, you know, since you was six, seven, eight, nine years old, from whatever time you've been able to play tackle. Now that one day all of a sudden you're done, you're done playing, and you have to, supposed to have to turn this aggressive nature off. However, you're talking about something that's now ingrained in you. So I can see a pattern where a lot of football players once they're done, even while they're playing, it's easier for them to get into physical altercations than than normal society. Sure. And I think it has a lot to do with, you know, the aggressive nature that they've been programmed that they must have in order to play the game of football. So I think that's another aspect of mental health that has to be considered because, I mean, it's part of it because it got you wired up. To, to combat everything from a, from a physical standpoint, but that's just not how the world is, and that's not normal. Right, right. That's exactly right. Yeah. So what's yeah. You know, what's what's a guy like uh, Booby Miles? What's a guy like Vince Young? How how are they going to act? Well, everything was promising. Everything was going their way. They had the world in the palm of their hand, but the problem was it was mental. Right. It was not physical. They were physically gifted athletes, and there's so many of these guys. Imagine. You know, we, we talk a lot about pro and, and college, and we'll use football as an example. You know, there's 700 colleges. You know, there are just thousands and thousands of college athletes. And a mm-hmm. super, super small percent actually make it. What sets them apart? Is it their just their physical attributes? I, I don't think so. I think that these athletes have some understanding of what makes the car go. You know what I mean? Oh yeah, most definitely. Most yeah. definitely. They've been they've been educated on that piece. They've been they've been mentored and educated on that piece. And another thing too, um having a thorough understanding of of the IQ of the game, which which again is mental, that goes hand in hand on being able to be calm under those circumstances. I mean it's not just IQ, but actually knowing the game on a high level Will, will, will allow you to think a lot calmer and relax a lot more because now you're not up for it takes a little pressure off yep yep that makes all the sense so let's hang tight with us we're going to have to run to a commercial break here in just a second and uh, we'll be right everybody hang tight we'll be right back you're listening to the mind coordinator with Dr. David Spooner on KSHP AM 1400 107.1 FM and BSX Digital Sports Network. Embark on this thrilling journey into sports leadership with me, Dr. David Schoonover, every Sunday morning from 9 a.m. to 10 a.m. on KSHP, exclusively on the VSX Digital Sports Network. Gain valuable insight into the minds of coaches, executives, and administrators as we uncover the secrets of coaching brilliance. Tune in for exclusive revelations and endless inspiration. Be sure to catch every moment each Sunday, 9 a.m. to 10 a.m., right here, live on KSHP 107.1 FM. 1400 AM. Clear Sky Resorts invites you to experience the future of luxury glamping at their newest resort, opening August 1st, 2024, near Bryce Canyon. 
guests at the first and only glass-domed stargazing resort in the U.S. will be immersed in the stunning scenery of the resort's private 80-acre canyon, both indoors and out, and nights in your sky dome will be like sleeping in an aquarium of stars. Located in Cannonville, Utah, on scenic Byway 12, voted one of the most scenic roads in America, the resort will feature lots of fun on-resort activities, as well as one of the world's largest glass-domed restaurants. To book your reservation, please call 1-888-704-4445 or visit clearskyresorts.com. You're tuned into the BSX Digital Sports Network. Strap it up! Strap it up! You're listening to the Mind Coordinator with Dr. David Schoonover on KSHP AM 1400, 107.1 FM, and BSX Digital Sports Network. All right, guys, we are back. Thank you so much for sticking with us. We are talking with Talant Sawyer, just an amazing man. Just the, the profile, I could I could talk for days about, <laughs> hours and days about his, about his career. Just an incredible athlete. But I think uh, at this point in his life, he's turned into – Something that I think that it has an even greater impact, and that's him working with these young men and mentoring and coaching them. So let me ask, Lance, what inspired you to transition from playing in the NFL to mentoring and coaching young men? Well, I always knew how important it was to give back, and I figured what what greater way to give back than to uh, give back in something that I was familiar with, something that I that I have a passion for. And being able to give back the knowledge, you know, from a pro perspective, I don't think you can really put a value on that. Mm-hmm. When we're talking about, you know, the youth that's inspiring to to go to college, to understand how college work and how it works and everything you have to do as far as the accountability once you get to college. And if you're fortunate enough to make it to the pro, uh, you know, there's a whole nother level of accountability because, well, now the college accountability is even greater because they're paying you on that level now. So, you know, companies won't, you know, they won't fair value for exchange for what they're giving you. So, you know, it's a it's a different world now. But that's what kind of inspired me to, to want to give back and to um, do what I'm doing now. Yeah, that sounds wonderful. You know, the, the kids that you work with have got to be just awe-inspired because here you are. NFL player, you've played the game, you know how it works, you know the details inside and out, and they have got they if if I was a young player listening to you as a mentor, I'd be sucking up every bit I'd be a, a, a information sponge. Oh <laughs> you know, uh, yeah, they I'd, <laughs> most definitely, yeah. They they super excited, you know. So I, I kinda give back in all sports, I give back in football, I give back in basketball. I do have a background in basketball, but um even in, even in baseball, so I do all around um, strength and conditioning training. So, and I got friends that you know play basketball at the highest level. Um, I have a son that played collegiate basketball, and I have friends that play baseball at the highest level. So, I can always reach out to those guys and get them on the phone, and even let them have a a word of encouragement, input, and give back in their own way to those kids that's playing uh those other sports you know what i'm saying yeah that's awesome yeah i'm sure that i'm sure they're just their mouth is going to be wide open listening to all that <laughs> most definitely it has to be um you know playing in the nfl is a whole different a whole different ball game and you know you see that you know the question i hear a lot is well these these elite colleges uh i'm an ohio state fan i always have i was born in ohio and i've i've followed them and i'm a fan if they have a bad year i'm still a fan but you you take a team like that <clears throat> Pardon me. And you have these kids are just incredible athletes. You know, they're the same size as a, a a pro player, but the the differences I understand is speed, understanding the the game a lot better, and these things they teach these young men important life lessons. So, for you as a NFL player, what what type of life lessons did you learn during your time playing in the NFL? You know, the first thing um, I think the NFL teaches you is 
just the camaraderie and the uh, the teamwork on a whole other level. Even though you, you you learn those things coming up in the game, but it just it goes to a a whole other level um, once you get to the NFL because now you know you're playing for bigger championships. Again, there's uh, bigger salaries involved, so you learn to play up under even bigger pressure. Um, so, you know, in life, you might have a bill come in the mail, but this bill that you, if you don't have the money for it, you kind of look at it as, you know, it's not the same pressure playing in front of, you know, a hundred thousand people. Sure. So, <laughs> sure. so, um, yeah, so you, you learn just lesson like that, how to deal with pressure on, on, on a whole nother level. Like the average person may look at, you know, adversity in a certain way you know we constantly deal with adversity you know um but it, it's physical a lot of times but in a greater sense it's mental because you know you got you got to find a way to outthink your opponent how to get through certain situations in real time while real bullets are flying in the course of a game so sure. then also you got to learn how to uh, process information at a high speed so to me I in the real world just from having that type of training, I'm always aware of things that's going on around me. I can process things, um, you know, fairly quickly and really get to my next move based on just that type of training that I, I have had. So, yeah, you know, it's just, and it's more things that it teach, but uh, those are kind of some of the things that, that really stands out. Yeah, that makes all the sense in the world. How do you use that experience, though, to Lance? How do you, you know, use your experience from pro football to mentor and guide these young athletes? Oh, the biggest thing is um, I understand what the body needs. See, coming up, um, Pop Warner, uh, Little League, high school, maybe a little bit more now, but when I was coming up, nobody really put emphasis on nutrition. Uh, proper weight training, you know, they just they put something together, have you go in there and do a little something. But there, there are techniques and in, in certain ways that you have to lift weights to keep from hurting the body, to keep from, you know, studying the growth. But but even bigger than that, the nutritional factor, especially now since we live in the fast food generation, everything is, mm. is right now. So, you know, I talk to the parents about how important it is for your kids to get the right nutritional value in their body if they're going to participate in sports because sports got a serious demand on pulling. You know, there's a lot of pulling, um, wear and tear. There's a lot of output when you're talking about football and overall sports. So that nutrition, your rest, all that is super important. So that's the main thing that I put emphasis on. We, You got to get past that part with me. I need to know what, what you're eating, what you put in your body. And if you're not putting the right things in your body, we got to get that corrected before we can get to the next step, before I even consider training you because I don't want you falling out on me. I don't want you having a stroke. I don't want you having a heart attack. You know, over the years, there's been a lot of kids that, uh, you know, sudden death, cardiac arrest has been, been real prevalent, you know, in our society when it comes to sports over the last 10 years. And I sure, think yeah. a lot of that um, is a, contributing to just bad nutrition and and not putting the right things in their body because we you know when I was coming up grandmother and mother them they was they was in the kitchen cooking and a lot of moms don't don't cook the way they used to so the food was you know a lot better coming out the <laughs> kitchen versus getting fat you know what yeah. I'm saying I versus agree. getting fat yeah. food yeah so we wasn't we wasn't falling out like that, even though we wasn't taking all the supplements and vitamins and minerals. We didn't know about all that, but we still wasn't falling out. And I, I just contribute that to just, uh, you know, getting home cooked meals, getting getting better nutrition. Yeah, totally. You know, that's uh, we, that you're right. That that fast food mentality. You know, truth be told, about half the food that we eat in America is not even allowed in Europe because of the chemicals. You know, you, you look at some of these things and you're like. Why does a Twinkie have a twenty-year shelf life? That thing should be, you know, it should be bad. It's week. crazy. It is crazy. <laughs> unbelievable, man. It yeah. certainly is. Yeah. One of the things that I do in my business, the Lighthouse Sessions, is I emphasize heavily what you just described. Except I, I use a different term. I call it self-care. So yes, you you've got to get rest. You've got to eat properly. 
right? And then we just talked about that. There's a, there are ways that you can eat good food and, 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 you know, sustain from that. You've got to get some, Oh yeah, most definitely. Uh, you got to understand what's going on between your ears. It's, you know, I, one of the analogies I use is like, Hey, you just went out and spent $500,000 and bought yourself a Lamborghini. Oh, it's red and shiny and it looks great. And you open up the hood and it's got a four cylinder motor in it. Right. Right. <laughs> so, something's wrong with that scenario. You gotta, you gotta have the, the, the right innards, right? The, the right things that make you, that make you go. Most definitely. Um, let me ask, Lance, what, what advice do you give? Now you're, you're talking to some college kids and they aspire to play at the pro level. What advice would you give them? Back to what I just told you first day, take, take care of your body. Um, get you a great trainer that understands what your body need, um, from a strength and conditioning standpoint to allow you to compete. Um, at a high level and also, you know, the biggest thing of is being able to, uh, make it to the pro level is, is, is trying to stay healthy, trying to stay injury free. So, and it's, it's hard to avoid that if your body's not being trained right. You know, you're going to end up having torn ligaments, you know, broken bones and it's the things you just can't avoid in football. Especially if the body is weak and is not trained properly, yep. you know these are things that's going to happen before you even think about getting to the league. You know you've been had all these injuries, which would definitely derail you from getting there. But the main thing is, um, you know, number one is, is working hard. Yep, got to work hard. You got to do something that's going to separate yourself from your competitors. Um, you know, there's only about three thousand jobs in the NFL. And we're talking means of kids trying to get there every year. We're talking Division III, NAIA, Division II. All, not even before we even get to Division I schools, Division I, JUCOs. So, I mean, they, they, they said when I came through, they were saying that, you know, we had a better chance of hitting the lottery than making it to the NFL. So yeah. that, <laughs> that, right. that lets you know <laughs> your, your chance. And I didn't, and that's not too, Tell no one that they can't make it, but you got you got to do everything you are supposed to do right, and you got to get a little help from the universe along the way. Certainly, yeah. You know, yes, sir. As as a therapist, one of the things that I've uh, and I I will, I've said this a million times. I've been doing this for twenty years. The biggest problem that adults and I'll and I'll say uh, even older teenagers that I found in my practice is the biggest problem people have is the truth. I think that there's so much nonsense going on with social media. You don't know what to believe. This is true. This is not true. And if you take someone like yourself and coaches like you and follow that that blueprint and you are speaking truth to these young men, I think it's going to make that transition to uh, graduating from college and getting out into the workforce a lot easier or uh, even going moving on to the pro level and giving it a shot, you know. But it's it's you have to be up front with these guys. You have to be – Bare knuckles truth with them because if you start filling their head full of nonsense, you're going to start running into a more you know a bunch more Vince Youngs, right? Um, what do you think, Clance? What are your what is your opinion? What is a key quality a quality? Excuse me, that makes a successful athlete off the field. Successful athlete off the field, um, just being able to. Not only uh, turn it off once you, you know, leave the facility or leave practice, um, but you got to, even while you're playing the game, you got to continue to educate yourself on on business, um, surround yourself with people that understand business, surround yourself with people uh, who has your best interest. So if you if you got that core, that core solid group around you, or even just one person who, who kind of have a little knowledge about everything? That's that's gonna because we all young when we go into the NFL, so we we're twenty some years old. We don't we really don't know anything about life yet, really. You know right. what I'm saying? So <laughs> right, you think you do. we you think still you, need, you think you know everything? Right. <laughs> then on top of that, we get a little money, so now we really think we know everything and don't want to tell because we we're making more money than the person that someone's telling us you need to go you need to go get some mentorship from that person. 
But we feel like since we're making more money than him, we don't need to listen to him. But we all need our coattail continue to pull, being poor, you know, all the way until we probably get in our 30s, man, because everything you thought you knew, you find out, you know, from the 20s on into your 30s that you really didn't know nothing. Right. But um, to kind of answer your question, uh, I just think having a solid a solid mentor and having uh, solid people around you and also having a strong push and motivation to be self-educated, to learn things, you know, way beyond um, the game of football or whatever professional sports you're playing. I think that will help you be definitely be successful uh, off the field. Definitely. I absolutely agree. Teaching these guys what it's like to be a man, teaching them what it's like to be a woman, teaching them about real life. Here's, you know, what, like you said, you, know, you get that bill in the mail, right? you got to pay the bill, that kind of thing. So Lance, Most uh, we're going we're gonna to take a quick short uh, break here. Guys, everybody's listening. Hang on. We'll be right back. You're listening to The Mind Coordinator with Dr. David Schoonover on KSHP AM 1400. 107.1 FM and BSX Digital Sports Network. Serve it up! Serve it up! Serve it up! Clear Sky Resorts invites you to experience the future of luxury glamping at their newest resort, opening August 1st, 2024, near Bryce Canyon. Guests at the first and only glass-domed stargazing resort in the U.S. will be immersed in the stunning scenery of the resort's private 80-acre canyon, both indoors and out, and nights in your sky dome will be like sleeping in an aquarium of stars. Located in Cannonville, Utah, on scenic Byway 12, voted one of the most scenic roads in America, the resort will feature lots of fun on-resort activities, as well as one of the world's largest glass-domed restaurants. To book your reservation, please call... 1-888-704-4445 or visit clearskyresorts.com Embark on this thrilling journey into sports leadership with me, Dr. David Schoonover, every Sunday morning from 9 a.m. to 10 a.m. on KSHP, exclusively on the VSX Digital Sports Network. Gain valuable insight into the minds of coaches, executives, and administrators as we uncover the secrets of coaching brilliance. Tune in for exclusive revelations and endless inspiration. Be sure to catch every moment each Sunday, 9 a.m. to 10 a.m., right here, live on KSHP 107.1 FM. 1400 AM. You're tuned into the BSX Digital Sports Network. You're listening to The Mind Coordinator with Dr. David Schoonover on KSHP AM 1400, 107.1 FM, and BSX Digital Sports Network. All right, we are back, guys, with Talan Sawyer. Just had an amazing conversation. I uh, want to just uh, talk to you real quickly here, Talan. Give me one quick second here. <laughs> We're talking about what's going on with individuals on the field. We're talking to what's going on with individuals uh, at home, you know, and everything that's included in that. I want to talk to you about um, some fun things. So let me just ask, Lance, we're going to just lighten this up just a little bit here. What is, you know, you, you, you see all these rituals that happen in college and, and pro. What are some of the, the funniest rituals or pregame ceremonies you've seen in your career as a pro player? <laughs> pregame uh, ceremonies, you mean as far as uh, guys getting ready to go out there to, to battle? Yeah, guys getting ready to go out there or, you know, they get out on the field and they're doing wild, crazy things. What you see a lot of these different things happening. Oh, uh, probably the most uh, probably the funniest pregame um situation. I've probably seen two guys uh, kind of slap each other with some shaving cream, you know, no shirts on and <laughs> then they <laughs> then they both uh Inhale a little these these ammonia packs. I think they were like smelling salt, so they passed that. But they want to pass it. Around. They want everybody to do. Once they do it, they want everybody to do it. Yeah. But uh, <clears throat> so if you refuse to do it, they they trying to go into 
you know, man, no, step some, everybody's doing it. So it's kind of, you know, you kind of have to be in the locker room to see it, but it's kind of crazy. But the um, the funniest thing uh, doing the game was with Randy Moss. Uh, he caught a touchdown up in uh, Green Bay, and he he mooned the crowd. <laughs> And that that oh, kind of went viral, man. Yeah, it went it went viral. <laughs> I remember back in oh when uh, Don Meredith. And now this is I'm aging myself here, but Don Meredith and Howard Cosell and those guys a long, long time ago. And uh, it was a Monday night game, and everything was going well. And uh, Don Meredith was a, a big. Uh, he did a lot of uh, Lipton tea commercials back in the day. And uh, mm-hmm. we're watching this game, and this guy takes a really hard hit, and they're following this guy off the field, like the camera's right on him. This is, you know, He got dinged. He's walking off the field. He looks all right. And the guy bends over, and he throws up. And, the, and right, I mean, the, like two feet away from the camera. And the first thing Don Meredith says, well, Howard, that wasn't lipped a nice tea. <laughs> you know, they, go a, they go to a break. You know? I, mean, I mean, even though that it was a kind of a, you know, a, a tough situation with the kid. You know, but, you know those guys, they try to throw a little, little fun into it, you know. Right. <laughs> Let me ask. Most uh, yeah. So that's what kind of, what do you suppose the, it's probably hard. You've probably dealt with so many people and coaches and assistant coaches uh, in your lifetime, I'm sure. But what do you think if you could nail down one thing, what's the best piece of coaching advice that you've ever received? Best piece of coaching advice I ever received. Um, Man, there's so much. Uh, yeah, there's got to be just I've been, volumes of it. Yeah, I've been. <laughs> yeah, I've been fortunate enough to have some some pretty good coaches. Um, probably just it was real simple. Probably just telling me to master the fundamentals. You know, just um, I always felt like I had the talent, um, but the fundamentals is what separates you once you. Once you get to playing against other pros, you, you got to be fundamentally sound. Do you're not going to be successful because everybody got talent, everybody fast, everybody big, everybody strong. The fundamentals and the mentality it was going is what's going to separate you. So, I think I was in high school when a coach told me to to master the fundamentals of the game and everything else would you know work itself out. I think that's exactly right. I, I, it just irritates me sometimes. I'll, I'll watch a baseball game, and you know when you're when you're playing baseball and you're growing up, they always tell you like if you're an infielder, you get in front of the ball, you know, two hands on the glove. If you're an outfielder and you're going to catch the ball, two hands on the glove. And you got these guys making hundreds of millions of dollars. They're out there playing right field and they go to catch a fly ball with one hand and they miss the ball or it pops out. And I, right. I, I go, ex- <laughs> I go exactly right back to what you're saying. Fundamentals, man. Two hands on the ball. Fundamentals. Right? Yeah, uh, I agree. I think, I think I do it right every time. Yeah. Yep. yep, I think that's right. All right, hypothetical here for you, Lance. Here we go. If you could coach any historical sports team, what team would it be and why? You said a historical sports team? Yeah, and let's let's just, I guess it could be any team, but uh, I think since we're talking football, let's stick with football. You get to coach any football team in history. What team is it, and why would you coach them? I would go back and coach the um, the Vikings um, in the Super Bowl when they played the Dallas Cowboys and Drew Pearson caught the Hail Mary. <laughs> I think because those were like our best opportunities as an organization to, to win a Super Bowl. Yeah. That's the, that we got to like three or four of them uh, with – with Fran Tarkenton and Sammy White and um, Amar Rashad, those guys, um, um, Mr. Foreman, who played running back, and the Purple People Eaters was the defensive line. Yep. Um, but I think one element that wasn't necessary in the game back then was the uh, the prevent defense. Uh huh. Yeah. So that allowed um, that allowed the Cowboys to be able to catch that the Hail Mary where he only had to kind of deal with one defensive back back there, maybe two, but I would, I would go back and I, mean, I would put 
everybody back in the, in the end zone. Except <laughs> only probably two guys will be rushing the quarterback. Everybody else will be back in the end zone. <laughs> and your job is to jump up and knock this ball down. Because Do if we knock that ball down, we, we, we got a Super Bowl. Right. Do not so, let yeah, I, catch I, that ball. Exactly. So I, I would go back and coach that game right there. You know, I remember Fran Tarkington, and the thing that I remember most about Fran Tarkington, he would run around, he'd run 20 yards behind the line of scrimmage to throw a three-yard pass. Man, it, it, it almost looked like he was literally in the playground just playing around. <laughs> yeah, it certainly, it certainly was. Yeah. All right, man, so listen, everybody hang tight. We are going to run to a quick commercial break here. Uh, we are having just a, an amazing insight from Lance, to Lance Stor- Sawyer. Everybody just stay put. We'll be right back. You're listening to The Mind Coordinator with Dr. David Schoonover on KSHP AM 1400, 107.1 FM, and BSX Digital Sports Network. I'm Lieutenant Colonel David Flippo, and I approve this message. Open borders, crime, inflation, failing schools. Is this the nation Democrats think we truly deserve? Republican Colonel David Flippo stands ready to represent District 4 and all Nevadans with unwavering commitment and strength. He's not just promising change, he's ready to deliver it. With a focus on economic freedom, Colonel Flippo pledges to cut bureaucratic red tape and create an environment where Nevada small business can survive and thrive, giving power to entrepreneurs and employees like you to drive our economy forward. As a combat veteran, Colonel Flippo knows the importance of national security. He's seen the border crisis firsthand and is dedicated to securing our nation and communities. On education, Colonel Flippo is committed to ensuring that parents have the right to raise their children with integrity and without interference. With Colonel Flippo, it's about taking real action that will shape a brighter Nevada future for us all. Early voting starts soon, and the primary is June 11, 2024. Blue no more to get ahead. In District 4, let's flip it red with Colonel Flippo. Paid for by the committee to elect Lieutenant Colonel David Flippo. You're listening to The Mind Coordinator with Dr. David Schoonover on KSHP AM 1400, 107.1 FM, and BSX Digital Sports Network. All right, guys, we are back. I want to give a big thank you to Talon Sawyer today. He has just given us some great insight on on uh, on youth, on mentoring, on what it's like in from Pop Warner to the pro levels. So we want to give a big thank you to, to you, Talon. Thank you so much for joining us and your valuable insight. No problem, man. I'm glad I could be here, glad I could be a part of it. Yep, absolutely. Uh, I want to so- shout out to our sponsors, Fubo, and I also want to give a special plug for the Lighthouse Sessions. That's plural, Sessions. Uh, that is my business. I am in the business of helping people get it together. I don't do the work for them, but I give them the tools, and I teach them how to just be better people all the way around, okay? Um, listen, as we conclude today's discussion, it's important to acknowledge the Evolving cultural attitude towards therapy and mental health. Perspectives may vary across different societies and communities, but there's a noticeable trend towards greater acceptance and understanding of mental health issues. The shift is not only engaging, but it's essential for fostering uh, an environment where individuals feel empowered to seek the support and resources they need to address their mental health concerns. By breaking down barriers, challenging the stigma, and promoting open dialogue, we can create a more compassionate and inclusive society where everyone feels valued and supported. Remember, reaching out for help is a sign of strength, not weakness. If you or someone you know is struggling with mental health issues, know that support is there. It's available and you're not alone. It's the strength of getting the support, not the weakness, right? Let's continue to advocate for mental health awareness, destigmatize this therapy, and create a culture of compassion and understanding. We have to understand that mental health is just as important as physical health. 
Seeking help is a sign of courage, not weakness. We have to challenge these things. We have to promote acceptance. I want to thank everybody for joining us today, locally and around the world. Thank you so much. Once again, Talon Sawyer, thank you so much, sir, for your, your great, valuable insight. We have to understand that it's a game, but it's different. There's so much different these days with social media, with NIL. We could talk about that forever. The best thing we can do is learn to be better men because this, this game of football, this game of tennis, this game of ice skating, whatever the sport may be, you have to understand that they're short-lived. So listen to your coaches. Seek the mental health. If you're having issues, talk to somebody. It is not a stigma. It's the only way you'll be better because sports are short-lived. Four or five years and you're done. Take your money, put it in the bank, invest it well. Listen, if you had a broken leg, you wouldn't wait two months to get it fixed. If you had a broken arm, you wouldn't wait a month to go get it fixed. If there's something, and we'll call it broken, it's fixable. But you cannot fix the problem with the same mentality that got you into the problem. So as it goes, guys, reach out. The Lighthouse Sessions is open. Uh, go to my website, and we can connect that way. I'd love to help as many people as I possibly can. Thank you so much, guys. Have a wonderful day. We'll see you next time. With Dr. David Schoonover on KSHP, AM 1400, 107.1 FM, and BSX Digital Sports Network.